Welcome back, everybody. Welcome to the MIT Category Seminar. Today we have Tarmo Ustalo, who's going to talk about monads and co-monads and their interactions, algebras and co-algebra. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask by raising your hand or writing in the chat or on Zolip or on YouTube. All right. Hi, Tarmo, and please go ahead. Uh, hello, Paolo. Thanks for the invitation. I hope the sound is OK, right? Uh, it seems so, yeah. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to talk, as, as Paolo mentioned, about monad comonad interaction laws. I'm going to explain what it is. It is something uh, we've been playing with uh, for some time now with Shinya Katsumata and Ezekiel Rivas, um, uh, also in connection with monad algebras and co-algebras, which is uh, late, uh, a more recent work together with Nils Fornefeld. So it's a mixture of um, some category theory and some programming language semantics. And the motivations come from programming language semantics, uh, in particular, factful uh, uh, programming. Uh, so programming, functional programming with uh, outside world effects, such as state or non-determinism um, uh, exceptions, etc. cetera. Um, So let me explain what the context is. Uh, so my paradigm for this talk um, that you have to keep in mind, and also the color coding is the following. So um, when you've got a purely functional program, then the thinking is this needs nothing from the external world to take you from the input to the output, so to say. I mean, a function is a mathematical function. Given um, an argument, uh, it should be predetermined and well-defined what, what it's what the corresponding return value is from the function. That's not so with, uh, with what uh, functional programmers call effectful programs. These are essentially programs that use some sort of outside services for, uh, for going ahead or to run. Like uh, if you've got a program manipulating state, it will uh, write to the state, it will try to read from the state. It hopes that you know if it wrote something, when it reads it back, it's the same thing. So there is a certain contract to be met. So a program runs in an interaction with, with the outside world or with a, with a platform that it runs on that is uh, sort of offering the services that the program needs. So um, uh, there is programs that don't run alone, but, but, but when embedded in an environment um, and then they can work together and go ahead and produce the return value of interest for us from a given uh, computation, and also return some final state. Uh, so, so for example, as I already said, a stateful program needs some underlying execution platform that coherently responds to fetch and store commands or, or read and write commands, however you call them. Or for example, if you've got a non-deterministic program, then it needs an outside party to do the uh, coin tossing for it, right? So it needs a ma machine for making choices, for example. Um, so in this talk, um, I'll talk about functor-functor interaction laws and monad-comonad interaction laws as mathematical concepts for describing this type of interaction protocols happening in this scenario. The functor-functor interaction laws are really, uh, in some sense, just auxiliary or kind of a help tool. They are there for unrestricted notions of computations, but the, the, the relevant ones are monad-comonad interaction laws. Uh, because they are for notions of computation that we have in programming languages, where at least the following things are possible under any notion of computation, namely doing nothing, which corresponds to sort of skipping or identity in, in a programming language, and sequential composition, which is your, well, composition or semicolon in your, in your programming language, right? Of course, typically in a programming language, we have a bit more. We have, we have uh, choices kind of built in, and we also have iteration or star, Clean star, but let's let's ignore those for the moment. Um, uh, what my plan is is to introduce these notions of functor, functor, and monad, comonad interaction laws, give some examples, and also give some degeneracy theorems that maybe indicate that the concept of a monad, comonad interaction law is not as powerful as you might want. And then I introduce a fix that I call residual interaction laws, so they sort of fight back these degeneracies. But not only, and uh, there is really good reasons to actually deal with residual functor, functor, and uh, monad, comonad interaction laws. Um, I will actually try to flesh out which is the minimal structure in which these kind of objects of interest are possible. 
And uh, it doesn't have to be about functors, monads, and comonads. Actually, you can speak about object, monoid, and comonoid interaction laws in any dual category. And the story about functors, monads, and comonads just happens to be uh, a special case of what you get in, uh, in the dual category of endofunctors on a fixed base category. Um, then I'd like to introduce a co-algebraic perspective into this. So combine monad and comonad interaction laws with um, monad and comonad algebras, co-algebras. And then I'm interested in the following thing, like given a programming language, uh, then that comes with this uh, notion of um, effectful computation that, that we want to work with, what is the sort of universal uh, machine <laughs> or what, what's the universal notion of environment uh, with which I can always uh, canonically have interaction with. Um, so um, this of course turns out to be about some sort of universal objects and here I need to introduce the concepts of dual and Swedler dual uh, that sort of uh, generalize these concepts from algebra of all places. And then I show you some examples of those. So I might not get to the last two bullet items, but, but, but maybe I will. So we'll see as we, as we go. Um, what is a functor functory interaction law is a very simple thing. Uh, we, I keep working in, in one fixed base category C, which I take here to be Cartesian with finite products, but actually the whole story also works with just symmetric monoidal. In examples, always think that this category C is, is sets, that's intuitive. And then an interaction law between two functors is nothing else than two functors, F and G. F embodying a notion of computation, G embodying a notion of um, environment. And then a certain natural transformation, namely one with components um, phi xy, which go from X, Fx times Gy to x times y. How are we supposed to read it? X you think of as any given set of values that you want to run your computation over. Y you want to think of as any given set of states that your notion of environment operates on. Um, so F is then this notion of computation, G is the notion of environment and Fx is the type of computations over a particular set of values and Gy is the, well, I already said type, types and sets are synonymous for me because I've got a type theory background, but here's just thing set. So GY is a set of all environments um, over a state. And the idea is then if you've got a computation and an environment, these must be able to work together such that you, in the end you extract the value, which is then the return value from the computation. And you also extract uh, a final state of the environment. So this GY is a set that actually includes the initial state and, and information about uh, how, how, uh, how the environment uh, evolves. Let me give you an example, then you get the feel for how I think about it. So here's, here's one. Uh, here's my F, here is my G. This is how they are defined. And you will read them like this. So <laughs> FX is the type of computations that in the end are supposed to return a value from X. Um, but what the computation does is it first outputs an element of type O. So that's part of the information in there. And then it continues, let me see if selection works, not very well. Okay, let me not do it. I'll just go like this. Um, and then it continues as a computation that uh, lets an external choice happen, but then depending on the outcome of that choice, it either goes to the left or to the right. If it goes to the left, then it wants to have some input, a value from set to I, and then it, continues and returns a value from X based on that information. If, if the external choice is made differently, it goes to the right, just outputs some token from O prime and returns with a value, uh, uh, some value in X. Yeah, so this is the type of these computations and they interact well with environments of the following type. So F as the first thing wants to do output, G as the first thing wants to do input. So the <laughs> The, 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 the computation wants to output something, the environment is ready to grab it and then go and make a choice. Now internally for the environment to go to the left or to the right, if it goes to the right, to, to the left, it outputs an I, which is the one that the computation wants to input. 
and goes on to stay some stake in Y. Uh, in the other case, which is its business to choose, it requires input, which will be what uh, the computation is forced to output. And then depending on what that value is, it uh, produces some final state Y. And the two can work together. So here is a simple sort of lambda term that, that embodies it, right? <laughs> so this is your computation. This is the environment. So what you have to do is you have to apply the function G to the little o that is here in this pair that an uh, element of this set is, then depending on if the outcome is, is uh, you know, left or right, it's either i and y. If it's i, then uh, the computation will apply the function f that it has. It knows how to continue to i, and it will reach some final value. And here we already produce a y, which is a final state. This y is a final state. If, uh, on the contrary, the environment at this point uh, inputs something, um, then uh, uh, this must come from the output from the program. So th this is this O prime here, the H, the function that the environment wants to run is applied on O prime. This is the final state. And what is returned is, is, um, is the one that is fixed here. It's, it's, it's this, this little X here. But this is just one of these possible interactions because you can play differently. So for example, the environment at this stage here might completely ignore what the computation put out, but instead, for example, work with some chosen constant O0 from O prime. So it discards whatever the program put out and, and pretends it read something else. Um, so there is, seems to be some sort of a duality here between these things, right? Because times has become function space. Uh, 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 yes, this times has become plus. Um, this function space has become times. It, it looks like I've produced this in a systematic way. And indeed, this is what we'll later call the dual. G is the dual of F um, under this discipline. Um, uh, Um, but we, we can even take some different G. So, so, so let, let, let us make F interact with G prime, which is just functions from natural numbers to I times Y. Then I could do the following. So in the interaction, I completely ignore the first output of the computation. Um, actually, I, I also ignore whatever um, the uh, computation is willing to do if the choice goes to the right. Why? Because I'm, I'm, I'm just, G is the environment. G just um, is always applied to 42, which is a, a, a number. And uh, we just produce some I and Y, which correspond then to, 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 to the case of going to the left. So the, uh, the environment hasn't told this to the program, but it, but it actually always chooses to go to the right. <laughs> And it's going to ignore the first output from the program. So this is also a valid interaction. Um, monad Komonad interaction laws, they are for something more disciplined. Namely, they are a notion of interaction that works well with doing nothing and composition. So you do not put two functors to interact, but the monad against the co-monad. And... Uh, an interaction law then is a monad and a co-monad and the natural transformation, similar to the one that we had before. So I need to go from P of X and D of Y to X times Y, naturally in X and Y, but there are also conditions. The legend is the same. So given a computation, given an environment, I want to produce a final value, so a return value and the final state of the environment. <clears throat> but you kind of, um, hardwire the idea that if the computation was actually doing nothing, uh, so the computation was going from X to T of X using the eta of the monad, yeah, the computation is really trivial. It's a value viewed as a computation, then nothing should happen. So uh, injecting a value into a computation, making a computation like this, then interacting should be the same as just taking the environment discarding everything from there, just keeping the initial state and the final state is the initial state. Uh, so that's sort of 
compositionality with respect to doing nothing, and then compositionality with respect to sequential composition is the following thing. Suppose I've got a computation over computation. So the idea is really one computation following another. I could just see it as a computation simpliciter and then interact, or I could take my environment, blow it up into an environment over environments, which is like an environment is intuitively like a um, node labeled tree, more or less, where the nodes are labeled with states. And what you do is you take this tree and you replace every node with a subtree rooted that node. So every state will know what is all of the rest of the environment from that state on. So you do this, then you apply psi to the outside T's and D's, and then to uh, what is left, so the inside T's and D's. So it's uh, basically saying that interacting with a sequence of computations is the same as interacting with the first part followed by interacting with the second part. Let me also give you some examples of this. They are now really from programming semantics. So one that it really is a monad comonad interaction law is the following. You take T to be what is known as the reader monad. So it's just function space S arrows X for some fixed set S. Um, the comonad is S zero times Y for S zero also some fixed state. Um, and then there is some fixed function S zero to S. The legend now is the following. As before, the X's and Y's, X is always my set of values that the computation is working with. Y are the states of the environment. Here, perhaps I should then kind of emphasize that they are like control states of the environment because there is also another notion of state. So the state is paying some store service, um, which is readable only, but not writable. So S0 are the states of the store um, from the point of view of the environment. S are what the computation can view of them. So it's some sort of a projection. And this projection is done by this little C here. And of course the two can interact. So when this guy wants to um, read the state, this guy is happy to provide a state. This reads the state and finishes with a value in X. This guy um, um, uh, provides as output the current um, state of the store and finishes in, in this control state Y. Um, and there is a variation of this where you both read and write. So um, you, you, mod you, you model readable, writable state in, um, in programming semantics with what is called the state monad. Now, a simple monad that arises from the adjunction between uh, uh, product with a fixed set and um, exponentiation. Um, this is the monad. Um, and this is the corresponding co-monad here which is the universal one here in this case, interacting with this one. It, some people call it the co-state co-monad. They run, uh, they use different state spaces. One uses S, the other one uses S0. And again, the idea is the same. So uh, the environment can hold of some store, can have hold of some store and uh, the computation can only work with some, some view or projection of the store. So these data have to be there. So from, um, from a state of the store, you can extract the view, but also from a state of the store and the new view, you have to get the new state of the store, which is like updating the store. And they have to satisfy certain conditions, which are those of a very well-behaved lens, which is a very popular thing now in applied category theory, I, I reckon. So this is another case where you can interact. And, and this is also kind of obvious how it happens because when this guy wants to input, this guy wants to output, when, when this guy wants to input, this guy <coughs> wants to input, this guy wants to output. So the, the two can work together nicely. And really the, uh, the two conditions that we had here, the equations, they are fulfilled. Um, now, um, monad comonad interaction laws, as you would expect, would be monoids in some appropriate place to say where, they're, where, where they are monoids. I have to say what the, what the map is between two functor-functor interaction laws. And it's the following thing. Uh, so given two, um, um, two interaction laws, Fg phi and phi prime g prime phi prime, it's just a pair of natural transformations. But now something interesting happens. One is in the forward direction from F to F prime. The other one is in a backward direction from G prime to G. 
such that this diagram here commutes. Uh, now, any one of you that has seen two spaces will say how this resembles the notion of, um, of a map between two two spaces. Uh, indeed it does, and I will get back to this point. But for now, I've defined what a, what a map is between two functor functor interaction laws. So they make a category. This category has a monoidal structure, which is based on composition of functors. I haven't shown this here, but it's easy to work out. And then, you get that these two categories are isomorphic. On one hand, monoid objects in the category of functor-functor interaction laws, and on the other hand, monoid-monoid interaction laws. These are nice, but um, there are also some degeneracy theorems. So one thing, for example, hap that happens is that uh, for certain types of monads, um, the interacting co-monads can never be interesting or they are maybe less interesting than you would expect. So the first type of degeneracy is here. If your base category is extensive, which roughly means it has co-products that are well-behaved, then you have the following thing. If the functor F, if a functor F has a nullary operation, which means, by which I mean, it comes with, with a family of maps, one to Fx, naturally in X, um, the underlying functor of the maybe monad is an example here because the maybe is one plus x. So we clearly have a map from one to one plus x, naturally in x. Uh, that's one case. A another case, if you've got a functor that has a binary commutative operation, by which I mean a family of maps like this, naturally in x, such that this diagram commutes. So here, multisets is an example because. Um, if I take two elements of X, then there is um, an obvious uh, operation that takes two elements and makes a multiset out of it. But if I, if I swap them, I do get the same multiset, uh, non-empty multiset. In both of these conditions, whether when F comes with a nullary operation or if it comes with a binary commutative operation, it turns out that whichever functor G it interacts with, G has to be isomorphic to constant zero, uh, which doesn't sound very interesting because then of course your interaction laws are trivial. Um, um, another thing that also happens is a binary associative operation is also bad. Uh, this cannot be stated for functors, that has to be stated for monads because the associativity operation requires uh, equating uh, not just two operations kind of, but two terms. So if T, so yeah, suppose the following, I've got a monad and it has a binary associative operation by which I mean a family of maps like this, such that this diagram here commutes. What is the diagram? There is three ways of putting three elements of X into TX. Now one is combining the first two with a binary operation, then um, getting to TX, uh, uh, then combining two TXs, uh, I also use eta, or the other way around. So these correspond to two sides of the associativity operation, uh, of the associativity equation. And an example here would be that T is non-empty list. Then you have that any interaction law between T and the co-monad obeys the following diagram, where you can basically see that if you've got three elements, you turn them into an element of Tx. And then interact is the same as you actually throw away the middle element <coughs> and just put the first two into Tx and then interact is the same thing. Or, or maybe you do the other thing. So uh, you, um, you, you uh, again, you throw away the middle thing. Um, it's uh, just the same way of stating the thing here as above, but using associativity differently. Uh, associative, the associative law of the base category. Then, um, yeah, you get, for example, that when you interact with lists, then the interaction law 
really can only see the first and the last element of the list of the given uh, non-empty list, but not any of the middle elements, which feels a bit weak. So that's like um, uh, non-empty lists are one way to model non-deterministic computations. And then it turns out that if you use interaction laws for them, they can only ever look at, uh, you know, the, the, the first and the last outcome of your non-deterministic computation, but not, not any on, of the middle ones. And you can counteract against this by uh, involving a second monad. So, so given some monad, typically you would perhaps use one of these monads um, that give these degeneracies like, uh, like this maybe or, or error monad, uh, non-empty multiset. Uh, the last one actually, yes, or, 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 or full, full finite multiset. That's possible. You could also use lists here. Then the residual functor functor interaction law is as before, but you have this R here. So what comes back from the interaction of two computations will be uh, a new computation according to the notion of computation R. So, so uh, a typical example could be that, um, uh, I don't know, maybe you have a computation that works with a state but can also throw exceptions. So it's a combination of maybe and state. You can't really deal with a, with a constant that comes from maybe, so that is left. So the residual monad is maybe, but the state effect is, is dealt with in the interaction. So the game now is you've got some effectful computation. Uh, the environment, which is the service for, for your effects, deals with some of the effects, but some of the effects are left. So for example, the state effect is, is dealt with, but the exceptions after that are there. Um, so that's for functor functor, but of course you can also formulate it for uh, a monad and the co-monad. Then the game is, you start with, uh, with a computation that is an element of T of X, where T is a monad. You start with an environment, which is an element of D of Y, where D is a co-monad, and you get back an element of R of X times Y, where R is this third uh, fixed ingredient here, uh, 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 which is a monad again. Now, <clears throat> um, the conditions will, of course, slightly change because, um, so, so, uh, so for example, in the first case for trivial computations, um, which is just an element injected into the, into T of X, uh, 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 interaction doesn't quite do nothing. You throw away the state, but then uh, for, for this to be well-typed, uh, the final state you have to inject into the monad uh, R, yeah, using the unit of R then. And similarly, <clears throat> when you're interacting, uh, so a sequence of computations is interacting with an environment, there is two ways to do it. In one case, you, you end up in R, R of X times Y. In the other case, you end up in R of X times Y, but you can use the monad multiplication to maintain these. And then of course, these R residual monad commonad interaction laws, they are monoids in the correct category, correctly formulated category of R residual functor functor interaction laws. Now, already said, this is similar to two spaces, right? So let's uncover this structure. To uncover this, we have to use uh, the day convolution. So the day convolution of two uh, functors f and g is given by this coend. Bullet here is co-power. Um, if the coend exists. Uh, and it turns out that the following is true. These categories are isomorphic. On one hand, are residual functor functor interaction laws. And on the other hand, two spaces on the symmetric monoidal category of uh, endofunctors on our base category with respect to the symmetric monoidal day convolution structure, where you take two spaces with vertex R. Uh, so what is a two space in this particular case? It is just a triple of two functors, F and G, and the natural transformation from F star G to R, where star is day convolution. Why is this correct? This is a trivial computation from Yoneda and the definitions of, of co-end and co-power. 
So natural transformations like this are the same as natural transformations between these home sets. Um, and then what is there? Uh, then I can rewrite this using co-and and co-power. Um, well, co-and first, this is kind of uncurrying. And then since at that point, X and Y only appear on the left, I can, uh, I can quantify over them using this co -and. and what we see here on the left is, of course, just F star G by definition applied to Z. So these functor-functor um, -functor interaction laws are nothing else than natural transformations F star G to R. Uh, that is nice, but something is already strange. But, so when telling this story, I did, didn't have to use that R was a monad, but I needed that R is a monad to even have a monoidal structure on my category of R residual functor functor laws. Um, so what is going on? What is going on is the following that although we characterized functor functor laws as two spaces um, over the endofunctor category on C with respect to appropriate monoidal structure, um, we do not immediately get a characterization from here of this category of R residual monad monad interaction laws. Why is that? Well, that's because the standard monoidal structure that there is on two spaces is built from the monoidal structure that we have these two spaces with regard to using some um, uh, construction with pullbacks. But we want something else. We actually want a monoidal structure that doesn't use any pullbacks, but it should in some places use the, uh, the, the other monoidal structure that we have in the functor category, namely the composition monoidal structure. But also notice here that we didn't get to use the monoid structure on R. We didn't use the fact that R was a monoid with respect to the composition monoidal structure. So what's going on is the following. These um, residual interaction laws are monoids in the category of two spaces over R or with vertex R, but with a different monoidal structure on that category of two spaces. So from where does it come? We actually have to use that the endofunctor category on C, um, the category of endofunctors on C has a doidal structure, which means two monoidal structures that work together nicely. Uh, so this nicety involves among other things that star is lax monoidal with respect to, uh, to the ID and composition monoidal structure. So we have these structural laws where the middle one is, is like a middle four exchange. And the, per, uh, sorry, the second one is like a middle four exchange. And the first one is a kind of a, a nullary binary version of it with the requisite properties. So now if you play with these, you can actually produce a monoidal structure on 2R based on composition easily. And then these R residual monad commonad interaction laws are monoids, monoid objects in 2R, you know, what, not with a canonical monoidal structure on 2R, but that come from the fact that in our case, this category we've got two spaces over, namely endofunctors has, has a doidal structure. And we use both of the underlying monoidal, monoidal structures there. Um, that is it. Now there is more one could say about um, these interaction laws in connection to programming semantics. Um, namely, they are related to something uh, that has been, that, that I've been calling runners and which I recently learned has been called co-algebras of monads in some other context. And I didn't, I didn't mispronounce it. People talk about monads and co-algebras of them. So this is some terminology that apparently first comes from operates where one also talks about co-algebras of, of operates, but you, one can talk about co-algebras of monads. So what's, what's this thing? I can explain it sort of very simply by the following thing. So suppose you're given a residual monad commonad interaction law, which I told you what it was. So it's a natural transformation like this, subject to two conditions. And then suppose you also are given uh, a co-algebra of the commonad D for some fixed Y. So this guy works for any X and Y, but now we fix the Y and there is a co-algebra structure on Y. Now putting the two together, 
in the obvious way, you can, you, you, you can produce a, a family of maps like this, naturally in X only, because Y is now fixed. And these are what could be called residual stateful runners. Why? Because they tell you what to do if you've got the computation and some initial state, how to, how to get the final um, value and the final state out of them without an explicit mention of the co-monad that would produce you know, the whole, whole environment from just the initial state. Yeah. So this uh, is so the uh, way that you produce this, yeah. There is a question from Sean Stern for Eckley. Sean, yeah. if you want, you can unmute yourself and ask directly. Hi, yeah. Um, in the previous slide, you, yep. you have this sort of interchange law and the identity of composition acting nicely with the star operation. So mm -hmm. normally when you see this kind of thing, you're uh, like to topologists or, or maybe people doing higher algebra would uh, expect some kind of Ekman-Hilton argument to happen here. Something like, do you know, do you know what I mean when I say Ekman-Hilton? Like a... uh, yes, I do know what you mean, but um, that works. So, so that first of all requires that the, um, it, it requires a bit more. What does it require? It also requires that the, uh, that the units of both monoidal tensorial units of both monoidal structure have to coincide to start with, no? Um, uh, I think they, yeah, perhaps they they end up coinciding as part of the as a consequence of the proof. I'm not sure. Um, mm, but I, do, um, I know very well what the Heckman Hilton argument is, but off the top of my head, uh, let me say why it doesn't apply here. Uh, so one of the assumptions is missing. Uh, so Joshua Myers oh, so, so first, is first pointing all, first out all, that this is an error and not inequality. Yeah, that is an, yeah, that's that's one actually. Yeah. So the important thing when you play these games is not to have this thing an isomorphism. Ah, uh, gotcha. Uh, yeah. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, exactly. Mm. So it's more more a distributive law than. Pardon? It's more like a distributive law. It's more like a distributive law. Yeah. I, I really said lax monoidal with respect. I mean, star lax monoidal with respect to that guy, not. Um, what do you call it? Strongly monoidal or simply monoidal, right? Um, yeah. Uh, thanks for pointing it out. I mean, it's uh, always difficult to remember what exactly is the the crux here, but it's exactly this. Uh, this is needed. So, so people also use it in other places. So, for example, uh, in concurrent clean algebra and sort of the categorical version of it, you've got sequential and parallel composition relating to each other in, in exactly that way that you have got a sort of middle for interchange law, which is just a natural transformation, not an isomorphism. And, uh, um, and it's a very non-degenerate situation there. Um, okay, thanks for the question. Um, yes, so, so this is one of the things that you can um, do. Um, and, and, and what is happening here? So we are, we are, we are putting together uh, an interaction law with a with a co-algebra of, of of the co-monad, and then we can talk in terms of um, some maps with good properties or natural transformations here, uh, without any reference to um, to a co-monad. So you can write down two equational conditions on that one. You you, you then call it a stateful runner, and it's a, it, it is a meaningful um, concept. And it's really about, you know, talking about a computation interacting with just an initial state. Um, the interaction is specified here. There is probably some underlying hidden co-monad here with its co-algebra, but we don't talk about it in this notion. And let me give you another one um, along the same lines, which is predicate transformers. Uh, <clears throat> so let me have even more things given. So there is a monad comonad interaction law residual. So there is also some R here. There is a co-algebra for a fixed Y of D, the comonad, which is like a state set together with a co-effect co producer. And this guy really what it does, it, it takes an initial state and works a whole environment out of it. So from an initial state, it produces a description of the whole evolution of the environment. 
but then I also have uh, an algebra, a monad algebra for R with a carrier Z. So now I also want to fix some Z and then there is a map from RZ to Z satisfying the conditions of an algebra. And then finally, I've got some fixed object X as well and the map from X times Y to Z. How are you supposed to think about these things? <laughs> X is the values that the computation operates over. Y is the uh, states of the environment and Z is the type of, is the set of answers that we may want to work with. And then F is something, it's just a given function that allows you from, uh, from, the, from the return value and final state to extract an answer that you are after. In particular, you could think that, that this set Z is, is, is a set of generalized truth values of sorts. Then this is really a value state predicate. Think even Z is Boolean, then it's literally a predicate. You could think of it as a post condition um, uh, for, 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 for runs of your uh, computations. So from the return value and final state, it, it extracts an answer. Given all these things, I can actually make a map F prime that goes from Tx times Y to Z. So here I went from X times Y to Z. Here I go from Tx times Y to Z. So this is like a predicate on the pair of a computation and a state you would call it the precondition produced from a post condition, like in, in predicate transformer semantics. How do you construct this thing? Not difficult, right? So given a computation and an initial state, you build the whole environment from that initial state, then you let the two interact. Then you apply RF, which means you transform these pairs of X times Y, which are under R to Z, and then you extract the answer. So uh, it's, it's a very typical thing you might want to do. Um, so uh, these uh, monad algebras in, in programming semantics, they're often called effect handlers in this construct, uh, sorry, in this context, because the idea is you've got something that is still a computation. Here it's like a residual computation over these truth values. But finally, I want just a single truth value. Maybe it is a non-deterministic computation, right? So under the sort of usual idea of non-deterministic comp computation applied to decision problems, perhaps this guy should simply take the disjunction of all the uh, Boolean values that sit here in this data structure. I mean, an element of RZ, for example. So it could be a, a way to resolve a non-deterministic computation finally into a deterministic one again, by just saying, you know, if, if you had a whole lot of non-deterministic outcomes, at least one of them was true, then the sort of, outcome in a deterministic sense of the computation is, is true. Uh, if they were all false, it's false. So where do these constructions come from? It turns out that interaction laws are deeply connected to functors operating on algebras and co-algebras of the monads and co-monads involved. So here is a bunch of alternative definitions of uh, monad, co-monad in interaction laws, which are trivial. This was the definition that I used but just playing around with carrying, uncarrying you, and Yoneda, you see that natural transformations like this are obviously in a bijection with natural transformations like this. So given an answer extraction function, I can actually go from Tx times Dy to Rz. So from a computation over values and an environment over states, I can get a computation over answers. So that's one way to talk about interaction, but there are also these two other views. <clears throat> So if I've got the computation over, uh, basically, um, so let's, let's call, think of these answers as generalized truth values. If I've got the computation over state predicates, then I can get a residual um, truth value from uh, my environment. Sorry, a residual computation over truth values from my environment. And uh, yeah, kind of the opposite game here. So this is trivial, but you can use it for something good. It turns out that residual monad comonad interaction laws are in a bijection with, um, with functors that send a pair of what and what to what. So a residual monad comonad interaction law is this guy here, natural in Y and Z, subject to two equations. Now I've written it in one of these alternative forms turns out to be exact the same thing as a functor that takes 
a co-algebra of D together with an algebra of R and makes an algebra of T in such a way that when you look at what happens on the level of carriers, it's just exponentiation. Yeah. Um, it turns out these things are in bijection also with a simpler thing, namely functors from um, the opposite of the Kleisley category of D times the Kleisley category of R to Allenberg Moore of T. Where here, instead of forgetful, you use the, uh, uh, the appropriate adjoint from the Kleisley adjoint, uh, junction, um, uh, co Kleisley adjoint junction. Um, so, so, so it turns out that this functor, what it does is fully determined on what it does on co free co algebras and uh, free algebras. And that's why this bit holds. Uh, we can try to do this game explicitly. So suppose I've gotten, uh, I, I'm, I'm given a residual monad commonad interaction of psi, and then someone also gives me a co-algebra of D and an algebra of R, which are these guys. I can really make an algebra of T with this carrier uh, very simply. I just use my interaction law. So interaction law can be seen as a natural transformation in this format. And then I just use the, the given uh, uh, co-algebra and algebra. And conversely, if someone gives me a monad common at interaction law, then I can, sorry, if someone gives me a, a functor that sort of does this sort of mixed exponentiation on co-algebras and algebras, then um, what, what I do is my interaction law starts here. Uh, I can use the unit, uh, the co-unit and unit of my co-monad D and monad uh, R. I get here. And then I just use the interaction law. Um, uh, and here the subscripts are wrong. It should be dy and uh, tz. Um, no, 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 I, 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 I said the wrong thing, sorry. I need to produce the interaction, so I don't use that. <laughs> Instead, I use what, the, what, uh, what, what this functor E returns to me. It, it will return to me um, uh, if I apply it to the, uh, to the to the co-free co-algebra on Y and to the free algebra on Z, it will give me an algebra of T with this carrier. And this is just, I need to use the structure map of this algebra. Sorry for getting it wrong. So this is all very simple. And you see that in this direction, you really only need to use uh, co-free co-algebras and, and, and free algebras, which is another hint why, uh, why this might be true as well. So this is quite interesting because it says essentially that if you're able to produce environments, if you, 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 are give, you, you have been given some, some co-algebra of the co-monad, if you're able to handle what comes back, the, uh, the answers in, 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 in this residual monad, then you're able actually, then you have a handler, then you have an algebra for T, but with a specific carrier, namely uh, the exponent of the carriers of these two things. So if you can produce environments out of a state set Y, and if you can handle um, uh, residual computations over answers uh, from, set, from, from the set Z, then actually uh, you are able to handle computations with respect to the original notion of computation over values which are dependencies of answers on states, because that's what uh, the function space y arrow z is dependencies of answers on states uh, like here i can uh, yeah i can work with uh, residual computation uh, sorry or com computations in the original uh, notion over over these function spaces y arrow z for fixed y and z so this is some nice observation but it turns out that uh, <laughs> Uh, th th there is actually a finer picture, namely, I've just said that these monad commonad interaction laws for T, D, and R, they are in bijection with carrier exponi exponentiating functors from co-algebras times algebras to algebras. But there are also intermediate versions. Uh, namely, you can characterize uh, these guys as just functors from co-algebras of D to runners of T and runners are these things that I had already introduced 
or you can also just see these as functors from uh, algebras of R to something else, which are which have of course to be functors from uh, the opposite category of algebras, uh, co-algebras of D to algebras of T, doing the right thing on carriers. But these things are also intuitively seen as, as as a thing in their own right, which we might be call we might call continuation-based runners. So this S run T here are R residual stateful runners, which you already saw, and C run DT are D fueled, we call them continuation-based runners of T. So what's this game? Um, <clears throat> Our residual stateful runners with a fixed carrier Y are natural transformations like this. So you see T and R are in the picture, D is gone. They can be defined as a thing in their own right with some, uh, uh, yeah. They have to be su uh, subjected to some equations which I'm not writing out here, but of course they have to sort of say the right thing happens with regard to the units and the multiplications of the two monads. But via currying, you can also say these are a much simpler thing that we know. These are just monad morphisms from T to the state monad with state space or state set Y. And they're not pure state monads, they are sort of R transformed state monads, which is the thing people know very well in programming semantics. And these are the same thing as, as, as functors like this. And that's exactly the picture here, right? We want to go from co-algebras to functors from Allen more over R to Allen and more over T. <laughs> so these are stateful runners. Whereas in this corner of the picture, I've played the opposite game. So I'm, I'm trying to study functors from here to here as things in their own right. And when you look at what they are, they're also something that uh, are pretty well known. So we're, we're talking about functors from uh, co-algebras of D to algebras of T, where on the carriers, this thing should happen. So Z is a fixed set. And we want that if I've got the co-algebra uh, with carrier Y, what should come back is a co-algebra with carrier Y out of Z. So we exponent um, Y and Z, exponentiate Y and Z. These things turn out to be the same thing as uh, what might be called defueled continuation-based runners. So it's, it's something like this. It's almost like interaction laws, except we are not natural in X and Z, only in, in X, Z is fixed. And there is no R in the picture, which should be here in this place where my mouse is, if I was talking about an interaction law. So sort of um, somewhere in the picture, lurking in the picture, there is morally, uh, an algebra of R, but now it's not here. Um, again, via sort of carrying things around suitably, this one should actually be a singular out here. You see that these are just monad morphisms from T to what looks like the continuation monad for answer set Z, except that this continuation monad again has been transformed and now with a co-monad put in this position. So this construction always, <coughs> whenever D is a co-monad gives you a monad. So that's, another way to, to put these things. And finally, actually, we can also go to this uh, uh, corner of the diamond. So suppose we already have a fixed uh, carrier, the Y arrow Z that comes back here for, from any such functor applied to uh, co-algebra and um, algebra. Can I somehow specifically talk about Eilenberg Moore algebras of T whose uh, carrier set is Y arrow Z for some fixed set. So it is, is an exponent of two sets. Uh, turns out, yes, there is also a running based view of this. So what is that? Um, Eilenberg Moore algebras of T with this carrier, if we work out what they are, they are nothing else than this. This is very simple to see. Comes from this very basic observation by, um, by Koch, I suppose, that uh, uh, algebras of a monad are related uh, 
to uh, monad morphism from that monad to continuation monad. But here we, are, uh, we can specialize it even further because my carrier is not arbitrary, it's an exponent. So I can see these things um, actually as monad morphism from T uh, to two isomorphic monads, which um, this line is wrong, it shouldn't be here. Uh, <laughs> monad morphism for T to, um, to this monad. And what is that? I can take um, kind of the external version of continuations monad where I do not use a function space or exponent. I just use uh, power. And then I can use this one to transform uh, the, the usual state monad. So it's like external continuations transformed state monad where the answer set is Z and the state set is Y. So that's one way to state the monad. Uh, but I could start at the other end. I could take the kind of external version of the co-state co-monad, where instead of um, product, I use uh, co-power. And then use that one to transform the standard continuation monad for, uh, for answer set Z. And you get here. And these two sets, you can easily check are isomorphic. I'm saying set, but actually it's, it's, it's objects in an arbitrary Cartesian closed category uh, um, with, um, Yeah, with small products and uh, uh, and some, so that we also have all these um, uh, uh, powers and powers and co-powers. Uh, so this is some view of these. So uh, the uh, the summary of this is there is there is a lot of connections between monad co-monad interaction laws and algebras and co-algebras. Of, you know, of the basic monads and co-monads that we talk about here, or the, or the given monads and co-monads that we talk about here, but also enter the picture, you know, transformed state and transformed continuation monads uh, in, uh, in various ways of, of stating what these things are. So, I mean, if you, if you sum up all these, <laughs> all these four latest slides, there is like 16 or something different versions of how, how can you state what an interaction law uh, uh, of TD residual with respect to R is. Um, I think I've almost used up my time. I also wanted, maybe I'll just mention or you stop me. I can quickly go over some points about it. So one interesting question is, given a functor or a monad or a co-monad, can you find the universal functor or co-monad or monad respectively interacting with it? Um, so I'm looking, for example, in the case of given a monad, I want to see a universal co-monad. I'm after this property. So I'd want that, <clears throat> I want that uh, there is some canonical map like this. So for T, there is some uh, universal co-monad question mark uh, with a canonical interaction law. And I'd like that any other interaction law, uh, sorry, that any interaction law between T and and, and, and any given common D factors through this uniquely. Yeah, that would then mean that in some sense, the question mark is the greatest quote, quote, uh, common. Uh, uh, how you do it has a lot to do with, with duals or more generally homes uh, uh, with respect to the deconvolution uh, structure that we have on, um, um, on the end of functor category, uh, on the category of end of functors and on, on our base category. <clears throat> so what's the game? Uh, let's again assume that C is Cartesian closed. They also have exponents around. Actually, I will also need uh, certain ends. So for a functor G, its dual is formally defined like this. So it's given by, a, by an end. So this thing uses G in a contravariant position. So assuming all these ends exist, so duals exist for, for all uh, end of functors, we have that dualization itself is a functor from the opposite of, end of, of the category of end of functors to the category of end of functors. And uh, if you're careful, then you notice that this dual is the special case of lolly star identity, where lolly star is the right adjoint of star, star being day convolution. So it's, uh, we're now using the, um, uh, 
actually the monoidal closed structure on, on the category C, comma C, uh, given by date convolution. Um, so the dual of G really is the greatest functor interacting with G. Um, and functor functor interaction laws between F and G, uh, sorry, functor functor interaction laws are really the same as pi of functors F and G such that you have a natural transformation from F to G dual or from G to F dual. Uh, <clears throat> For symmetry, everything is because of symmetry, everything is symmetric here. And the reason is trivial. So natural transformations like this are in bijection with natural transformations like this, natural in X only. Y has been quantified out by the end on the right hand side. <clears throat> and you get exactly the right type of universal property trivially uh, from here, which is by transpose the same thing. And this is already trivially uh, the case. Um, so one can calculate the dual in, uh, in many cases that is easy. So uh, <clears throat> for example, for, ex uh, for ex exponent with constant uh, domain, you get just product and, uh, and there are similar things. <clears throat> also the dual of identity is identity. Uh, however, the dual of composition of two functors is not composition of the duals, you only get uh, a natural transformation in one direction, which is something to notice, and that's important. Then there are other observations, of course. So for example, we already observed that if G comes with a nullary operation or a binary commutative operation, then the dual is necessarily <clears throat> isomorphic to constant zero. Um, um, so that's dual of functors, that's easy. Dual of covenants is also easy because uh, if you've got a co-monad, then you can just dualize the underlying functor and it will be a monad. Um, uh, and it will be a monad of the right sort. <laughs> and why this happens is because dualization is lax monoidal. So it sends monoids in the category of endo functors to monoids in the category of endo functors. And, um, uh, uh, but, but it's a contravariant functor. So actually it sends co-monads to monads, right? But dualization is not oplex monoidal, so it doesn't send commonoids to commonoids. So therefore, the dual of the underlying functor of a monad is not necessarily coming with a common structure at all. And then what you have to do is you have to play the same game that people do in algebra where, when one talks about the Swedler dual or finite dual or Hopf dual. We can talk about the Swedler dual of a, of a monad. Analogous to Swedish dual on algebra. Informally, it's a very simple thing. It's the greatest functor D <coughs> that is smaller than the functor dual of D and carries a covenant structure that I here call eta bullet mu bullet because it's derived from eta mu, the, the unit of multiplication of the monad structure on T agreeing suitably with just what you get when you dualize the uh, natural transformations eta and mu. Um, so formally what you need to do is, uh, <clears throat> is you know, to do this thing <laughs> formally, nothing else. So the Swedish dual of the monad is, is a certain co-monad and it's defined by a universal property. So uh, it has to come together with a natural transformation, which is inclusion of T bullet in T circ, where T circ is the dual of T just as an underlying functor, such that these two conditions here hold, which basically really say, you know, again, uh, T bullet is smaller than uh, T circ, but uh, it also has these uh, 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 co-unit and co-multiplication like things that agree with what we get when we dualize the unit and the multiplication. And the problem we need the Swedish dual at all is here. It is that the dual of a composition of two functors is not isomorphic um, uh, to the composition of, of, of the duals of these two. I can only go in this direction. I'd like to have this uh, because if that were possible, I could simply take mu bullet to be that composition, 
but now this is not possible. So we, we just have to uh, go for these diagrams commuting for some slack that we add here by means of this iota. So this is just to say that um, it is a co-monad that is smaller. Now we have a co-monad that is smaller than T-cert, but then I have to say that it's also the greatest one among co-monads smaller. So any other candidate co-monad with the same properties uh, <clears throat> Uh, has to be smaller than t -shirt. That is all there is. And there are cases where the dual and the sweeter dual don't coincide. So for example, if I just take the, uh, let's take the non-empty list monad. If you just dualize the underlying functor, it is this thing, which I've written here with dependent types. So uh, it, is, uh, it is the set of all pairs of a natural number so, sorry, it's the set of all functions from that take a natural number to a pair uh, of a number in the interval from zero to n to, 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 together with an element of y. That is, the, that is the dual, which one calculate, can calculate by the general recipe. But the sweeter dual is something else. Uh, the sweeter dual is, is this thing here. So that one doesn't carry the structure of a co-monad and then one has to go smaller and this one does, and that is the right one. It's similar there for the state. So if for the state monad, if the, for the underlying functor of the state monad, you calculate the dual, this is T-cert here. You get this thing. Mm. Uh, but, but the sweeter dual is what it actually morally would have to be, namely the corresponding co-state co-monad uh, for the same, uh, states at S. So these were some examples. Okay, the takeaway, I've shown you a single framework for talking about computations, environment, and the interaction. That's the first part about monad comrade interactions. Uh, there is also the part about co-effect production and effect handling. So um, what do interaction laws mean if I combine them with some given um, algebra of the residual monad or, or with some given co-algebra of the co-monad that we use uh, as a notion of environment. There's lots of mathematical structure around, a lot can be stated very generally. And for the future, I'd like to have a deeper understanding of the co-algebraic aspect. Uh, one question is how to calculate these uh, sweeter duals. Um, there is one answer in, in Garner's recent work that, was, that he presented at the Opera pop-up some months ago. Uh, maybe a, a, um, a more interesting question even and more difficult one is, is the Swedler home. So this is the situation where there is a residual monad. The residual monad is not the identity, but it's, it, it, is, it is some non-trivial R. So then you've got both T and R given. So you've given a notion of computations, you've given a notion of residual computations, and you want to work out the universal notion of environment. So from T and, um, and R, you want to work out the D. And here again, a problem arises. So uh, if, you, if you just take the home, uh, <clears throat> the lolly star uh, on the underlying functors, it will not in general be a co-monad, so you have to cut it down. And the corresponding notion is, is known as the Swedler home. Yeah, that is it. Um, sorry for running over time, I think. Um. Okay, thank you so much. That was a, quite an interesting talk. So does anybody have questions or comments? Feel free to raise your hand or to write in the chat. So in the meantime, I have a small question. Could you go back to, I think, what you call the lolly star? Uh, yes, I hope so. Uh, yeah, what, what did you mean by that? So were you referring to, like, the fact that profunctors form a closed category, or what, what is... No, no, no. It's, it's just, uh, it, it's all in functors. So we're in the end of functor category over our base category C. Now, uh, uh, 
what I showed here was a special case of G lolly eat, but um, G lolly star R of X is exactly the same thing, except you have to put the R here in front where my mouse is. And that is, that is really, uh, I mean, the universal property is G lolly star blank is the right adjoint of um, blank times G where star is just the day convolution. So it's the, it's the, yeah. Yeah, that is all there is. I, I can't even say more. <laughs> so so oh, day convolution okay. so gives like, you, I mean, with enough like ends and two ends. Uh, yeah, 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 Ex exactly, yes. Uh, well, like in right. pre-sheet, here it's, here it's functors from set to set, but it's the same thing, right? Uh, so okay, assuming, assuming you've got your ends and co-ends there, which is of course not all, always the case. So you have to go to finite tree functors or whatever, or accessible functors in general. But then assuming, assuming these things are well-defined, uh, this is, yeah, this is exactly that. I see, I see. So, okay, we're Im imagining C to play the role of sets itself. Yes. I mean, instead, yeah, I think C is sets. I think we're doing finitary functions. So we're really talking about the day convolution, finitary functors. We're really talking uh, finitary set enter functors. So we're really talking about the day convolution monoidal closed structure there officially, nothing else. Mm -hmm. I see. So, okay, is there a question from Halime? I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Has the time of the talk changed? No, it hasn't. It's, it may be that some countries are switching to uh, winter time or summertime, depending on the hemisphere. So I can't, I, I, I'm not sure that in every time zone of the world, the time of the talk is the same, but in our time zone, it's the same. I. Okay. Anybody else has any question or any comment? Okay, I have another question. Sure. What is a co-algebra over a monad? Oh yeah, um, maybe it is somewhere on the slides already. Uh, it should be on one of the runner slides, which happened in two places. Yeah, just, um, just take R to be identity then people call co-algebras, yeah, <laughs> the, the short answer is co-algebras of T are R residual state for runners of T in the case when R is the identity functor. So spelled out, it means you've got, um, you've got a set uh, or say an object Y, yeah, carrier for the co-algebra. And then uh, the structure map is goes from tx times y to uh, x times y, subject to conditions uh, mentioning, uh, subject to two equations, one, uh, one of them sort of saying this agrees with the unit of the, uh, of the monad and the other one uh, with the uh, multiplication of the monad, of course. I didn't use this terminology here because uh, I, I'm, 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 I'm talking about the general R. Also, we, with, with the executive, we only learned about this terminology quite, quite recently. Uh, actually, from Richard Garner's talk <laughs> on, on calculating these sweeter duals, because uh, he, uh, he has a story about how to, how to calculate these sweeter duals, which is far more complicated than just duals. But only in the special case where uh, where there uh, yeah where there is no residue <laughs> in the sense that the, the R the the, uh, the 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 monad R is identity. Uh, but apparently this goes back to um, um, 
to, uh, to a 1966 paper by, uh, by Freud about algebra valued functors and a lot of work that ensued from there in particular by George Bergman. Um, now in that paper, uh, uh, Freud doesn't talk about co-algebras of a monad, but it's their co-algebras of a, of a Lovier theory. Uh, so rather than algebras, it's co-algebras. So it's basically the same thing, right? Uh, um, I see. But uh, one other way to, mm -hmm. so, uh, so there is also a connection between the runner story and the, the duals. So uh, if T has a Swedler dual, then uh, a coalgebra of T is exactly the same, or I mean, these are in bijection with coalgebras of the Swedler dual. So uh, in the presence of T bullet in what I showed after, uh, a coalgebra of T as a monad in this very unusual terminology is the same thing as, uh, as a coalgebra in the usual sense of, of the Swedish dual of T, which is a common. Yeah. But that is a way of talking of these things, even if the Swedish dual, for example, is not there. I see. Uh, Sean, if you want, you can unmute yourself. And... Oh, uh, yeah, I had uh, just asked if when the Swedler duel exists, or, or if you know when it exists. Mm. No, honestly, okay. no. In, in the general case, I, I really cannot say say much here. I mean, for, for, for the ordinary dual is it's kind of easy. I mean, you need your requisite ends and co-ends and powers and co-powers to be there. So for example, yeah, accessible functors will all, accessible end of functors will always do. Okay. Uh, but for the Swedish dual, this is trickier. I, I really don't know the answer. Mm. Okay. Also, it's it's very unclear how to compute them in general, especially if 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 R is not identity. I mean, which is the Swedler home then? Huh? So, are there some really uh, sort of want sufficient conditions when you know it exists? I mean, you had some specific examples, but are there some uh, sort of small classes where it's known to exist? Mm. So what can I say? Okay, so um, okay, for finitary set monads, they would be there. So if we take C to be set and we are after finitary, they would be there. And I can do it going through through Lovier theories or, 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 or theories or other presentations really. So given a finitary monad, you can, you can work out the presentation for it. And then all you need to do is, is basically uh, turn, around, uh, <laughs> turn around all arrows there. So <laughs> your, uh, your operations become co-operations and your equations become co-equations. Um, and the co-monad determined thereby, which is also then always there, is, is the sweeter dual. So this is, this is one case where we can construct it concretely. Uh, cool. But that goes by, uh, by a theories or the presentations. Thank you. And this is really maybe also intuitive and kind of explains why, for example, for state, you do get the co-state because it's, it's literally that, you know, uh, how, how, how state is, uh, is presented by say a signature where there are these two operations get and put with certain equations. Um, then if you turn everything around <laughs> uh, in terms of, you know, um, co-algebras for this type of signature, then it would also be get and put, but with, we, you know, with um, that, that denote algebra, co-algebras, 
you also have to do the same to co to, to equations, you get co-equations. And actually what you do get is exactly lenses and then the corresponding co-monad is, uh, is the co-state co-monad. So that's one example of that. Thanks. Okay, does anybody else have a question or a comment? All right, it seems that we have uh, none. Oh, okay. Larry Moss is saying, thanks. Good to see you and hear you. Uh, Larry, do you have thanks, a question? Larry. Or what's the, what's the yes? Let's, I think now we are all, ah, okay. Larry has to leave, but send me an box. Okay, so I think there are no uh, online questions, so let's get offline. Let me stop the streaming and the recording. And, thank you all uh, for yes, and well, thank you listening. Thank you again for a nice talk.